Good afternoon, it's Dr. Alan Yim. Today I am going to be talking about the Dies Irae, one of the most famous sections from the Requiem Masses of Mozart and Verdi. I'm also going to add in um, another one by Alfred Schnitke, and the reason why I'm doing this is to make a comparison between the classical, romantic, and 20th century styles, and in particular, to look at the harmonic content in these, the harmony that these three composers use and how different they are. So let's start by talking about what the Requiem Mass is and how the Dies Irae fits into it. So the Requiem Mass is written for a memory of someone who has died. It is part of a mass, it's a Catholic service and has text that is in Latin. The text was originally written in the Middle Ages by a poet. Uh, we think we know who wrote it. And it talks about the end of days. So this is Judgment Day. And of course, with it, it brings all the imagery of fear. And as you can see in this picture of anger and uh, all the associated emotions. So as far as the grieving of someone who's lost, that would be typical of, of a requiem. Maybe this represents the anger stage. So it's been said that there are five stages, anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. This would definitely be the anger phase of that morning. It sounds uh, very tumultuous, usually very fast. Mozart's commission for this came from this mysterious person who actually commissioned it for his wife. And Mozart didn't finish this. It was written around nine, uh, 1791 and after uh, Mozart passed away himself he actually saw this as a foreboding when he was writing it his wife Costanza, Costanza actually had it finished by some other composers so there is some confusion about what parts Mozart actually wrote and the Dies Irae section of this may not be all of Mozart You'll notice that in this, the drama is still in the classical style. It's, it's somewhat under control. It features an orchestra and vocal soloists, but it's not, um, it's not a huge orchestra. Typically in the, in the classical period, maybe there'd be somewhere between 30 and 40 musicians. And you could see here, this is a tenor clarinet, two bassoons, two trumpets, timpani, which are the kettle drums, strings, and the chorus. Down here, this would be the basso continuo, which is usually the bass instruments, cellos and basses, and possibly, as you can see here, the organ, well, not possibly, the organ playing the chords. So these little numbers down here tell the organist what chords to play on, and they generally improvised on this. The texture is somewhat simple, but I will point out that this is written in D minor, which again, minor is kind of a rare key for Mozart, and it's the same key as his first piano concerto written in minor, which is also in D minor. Also, if you listen to the opening of the D minor piano concerto, it has that same syncopated figure that you see in the bass here, this, in the basses. So the bass starts out. That syncopation gives it this driving feel like the piano concerto. So like a heartbeat sort of. All right, let's take a look at the chords. So I've written them all out here. It looks like a lot of chords up above. This is the, op the opening section, the chords for it. But actually, it's pretty simple. The chords that he uses, D minor, G minor, which is four, A, which is five, and the seventh of, the five seven, the dominant, and then the C sharp diminished, which is the seventh, um, the chord on the seventh degree of the scale. All of these chords are actually in the key, but let's go back and take a quick look at this. Down here, this four and this two, those are two notes that are not in the chord. E and G. Okay, E and G. So here's the D minor chord. And you can see they clash. 
So right there, it creates this dissonance in the harmony. That's about all the dissonance you get in, in Mozart. <laughs> There is dissonance in Mozart, a lot of, um, actually quite a bit, but it's not really as noticeable as we'll see in some of the later composers. All right, let me just play through these chords so you can hear how they fit in, starting from the top. Unfortunately, I can't point to these and play them, so I'll say them instead. So it does start out D minor. And that second is the add the G. And then A7. So that's the D minor. A7 to D minor, and then, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so that was the C diminished 7. And then, and then the A over C sharp to C minor, and then, and then there's a short, a really fast D7 at the end of that bar. Going to G minor, D minor over A, C7 over G, and then the D, D minor. Okay, so that's the opening of the Mozart. And again, the harmony is pretty simple, but the rhythm, this... Against the... Kind of provides the drive along with the dynamic, which as you expect, forte. Nothing extreme, but forte. Let's take a look at the Verdi. So Verdi wrote this um, in memory of a poet and writer that he really admired. You can see this is about 100 years later, um, 1874 for the Verdi, let's remind you, 1791 for the Mozart. Let's take a look at the score in a second. Um, it's in minor, of course, it's in G minor. <laughs> Both Mozart and Verdi were extremely successful opera composers, and a Requiem is perfect for these types of composers because a Requiem Mass is dramatic, especially in the Dies Irae. Verdi, of course, was writing in the Romantic period, so take a look at the size of this orchestra that he used. There are a lot more instruments. You could just notice along the left side here, so many instruments, Pick, two piccolos, two oboes, two clarinets, four bassoons, four horns, four trumpets, three trombones, this is a tuba, timpani, the choir, of course, just like Mozart, and the strings. As we go farther along, the most famous instrument maybe in this piece is the bass drum, and it provides this syncopated beat here. So here is the uh, bass drum accented fortissimo off the beat. I tell you, I would, <laughs> I think any bass drum player probably loves playing this because it's just, it's, you can just hit the thing as hard as you want. Um, so it's a really frightening sound when you hear it because you have this bass drum on the off beat. Um, something else to notice, Allegro Agitato. Mozart's is also a, a fast tempo, very fast tempo, but What's most interesting, in addition to the number of instruments, is the range that Verdi uses here. Because here's the contrabasses. I believe they're notated an octave higher than they actually sound. So the lowest note is G1 on the keyboard, the lowest G on the piano. And up here at the top, the piccolos, which are also transposing, in other words, they sound an octave higher than written they play the highest G on the piano. So you get this and all the octaves in between. I can't play all these, but they're, they're all there in the beginning. Okay, um, blasting out in all the instruments on beats one and three. So it's basically these four giant chords. Okay, to start out the Dies Irae. Um, then you see these very fast runs, these G minor runs, and the strings tremoloing. So this is a um, far more dramatic than Mozart's. But this. Oh, my hand's not working in the same. Okay, in the upper parts. Super, super, super exciting. In fact, this 
It's not the harmony really that makes this first part exciting. It's really these fast runs and then this chromaticism. So the first entrance of the, the choir is in the lower voices in the tenor and the basses and they sing this line. Okay, so and then the rhythm here is also something that you haven't seen yet and that is a double dotted rhythm. So notice this quarter note has two dots after it and then a 16th. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this is seven and this is one. So this note is held and at the very last minute, you sing this very short note into the next one. And it's, it's almost, so rather than, it's, instruments are playing this and notice that most of the voices hold this G and then the other voices this sustained G clashes against all these half steps Verdi uses lots of chromaticism in this piece meaning that the notes are often moving in half steps and if you can see here the strings are trilling during this whole thing so i think when you can feel the tension and then finally after the opening dis array when it gets into the other part of the text the chords start changing so let's go back and take a look at what chords verdi uses G minor and then it goes that's very classical because it's just a major and D minor okay so up to that point it's not very chromatic other than in the melodies but the chords aren't chromatic but after that you notice there are several chords here that have moving half steps. So, and then, and then. So that's the sequence here that I wrote. B diminished to C minor, A diminished to B flat minor, G diminished to A flat. You don't need to know what all these chords are. But listen to the qualities and notice that the, 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 the they're, they're kind of sliding down. You can hear and, and then So the harmonic language that Verdi used was a little bit beyond Mozart. It wasn't extreme in any way, but definitely with the use of chromaticism, you get a sense of more color and it, it just sounds like um, things are sliding around a little bit. And the chromatic scale, of course, was heavily used in the Romantic period. Okay, let's take a look at the last one. And don't forget, after you watch this video, to go to the links that are, I hope, up here and listen to these three short parts of the Requiem. Now, Verdi's Requiem is, it, it can be over two hours um, if you hear the whole thing. I think they do it in 90 minute performances, but I watched it once and I think it was over two hours with intermission and everything. Mozart's is not that long and this one is very short. It's only 35 minutes and actually it's not even much of an orchestra. It's a chamber orchestra. This was written by the 20th century composer Alfred Schnitka. He's a German-Russian composer. 1975, so more than 200 years after Mozart. If you look over here at the music, there's no key. And I have to thank, um, there is a YouTuber who posted this because you can't get this music 
um, in the Petrucci Music Library or online. It is, I presume, still copywritten. No key, it's super dissonant. It could not be more dissonant than it is, and I'll show you in a second. The instruments, trumpet, trombone, percussion, celesta, which actually is a percussion instrument, like a keyboard with some bars, metal bars inside, piano, of course, percussion, organ, electric and bass guitars. How common is it to see electric guitar in an orchestra or a chamber ensemble? It's not rare. So especially around this time period in the, I'd say 1950 to, 19, to 2000, electric guitar, you can find it in many and still people put electric guitar in ensembles. It kind of has a unique sound. It was written in, during a time in the Soviet Union when religious works were not allowed, especially ones related to the Catholic Church, I would say. And here's a picture of Schnitka. His music is built on seconds, but it also includes sounds like this and very, very sharp accents. So take a look at the score. Sharp, sharp accents and these notes, literally, if I put it in the organ sound here, this is pretty much what's written there. And I could play the exact notes. It starts on C and two in the left hand and in the right. And if you watch the video closely, you'll notice the pianist doing something like this. So it's a low B flat up to this A at the end. She's supposed to play or this. Triple forte. Okay. The choir sings similarly this. Over on the left side there. And at the very end on Dies Irae. Whoa, sorry, wrong. This. Along with everybody else. So. I think it's kind of interesting to hear this music. I think it's a little bit on the terrific side. Uh, over here on the left, you notice there's a huge block. And um, basically you take your forearms and if you're playing the piano, something like this. And if you observe, yes, the piano, the pianist does use her forearms. Typical 20th century technique. I hope you enjoy that. Listen to all three versions of these Requiem um, Dies Irae's and go ahead and read up on them. They have a, a really interesting history and the Dies Irae itself also is used, the Gregorian chant, in many pieces. We'll take a look at that later. I hope you enjoy this somewhat morbid music but also um, really thrilling to listen to. Thanks for watching.